<clears throat> okay, this is the pre-class video for class number 21. Uh, the last class before the class where we read, where you read your outlines for your final papers. So this class is, starts out with um, my experience in Indonesia, which is a predominantly Muslim country and how they have developed a republic. So the Muslims in Indonesia are moderates. They want to combine democracy with Islam. They're not extremists. And then a couple articles about the union of re, uh, reason and faith. This time you have Einstein, a physicist, and you have um, uh, Pokinghorn, a quantum physicist. So um, we'll start with that. Um, first point, I well, I will give this um, PowerPoint in, in class, so I won't talk about it too much right now. But there's Indonesia. It really is. It, officially, there's 17,000 islands. Uh, but of course, um, there's a few big ones, and that's where most of the people live. But there are two islands that um, <clears throat> are being evacuated because they're so small and climate change is causing them to be completely flooded over with the sea has taken over. Um, so here are the articles about the tsunami. And there's four different approaches to when there's a natural disaster. There's this huge natural disaster in 2005. And so these are, this relates to our um, discussion of is religion good for resilience or is it fatalism? And the first one sort of implies that God was behind it or that God could have prevented it. The second one was about um, about how we could have used science to prevent all the human tragedy because we had the technology to be able to detect underwater earthquakes and would have known that the big wave was going to come and people could have gotten out. So that one is a humanist approach, like science could have solved this problem. This one was about the possible deaths from lack of water, um, all sorts of other bugs and waterborne diseases, um, and how that was prevented um, based on human reason. Reason can prevent problems, and it did prevent some of those problems. And then this one is about how generally stingy Americans are um, and how they, what they're willing to spend money on and what they're not willing to spend money on. Um, so then I have, we have a discussion of what is corruption? What does it mean to say a person or society would be corrupt? Um, and then I have, you know, the outlines about suffering. These are just overall um, bigger issues of the class, but this is a way of looking at tsunami and you can go through this list before class if you want to. Why was there a tsunami? People are always trying to understand why. Well, and I gave what? I gave 12 different alternatives and you can think of your own, but you can also learn about yourself, I guess, by figuring out which one of these do I like best? And, or once you're figuring that, you might decide, oh, there's a different point of view that I have. So I am gonna ask you about this. Uh, which one of these did you pick and why? Or did you pick more than one? Or did you come up with your own view? So be prepared. Uh, the next point was, I asked you to read the first article in the Jakarta Post about holistic education. It's two pages long, and I have an outline over here. 
of these articles um, were created by God and um, throughout history, uh, God has condemned greed, all these vices. Um, we appear to be managed by educated technocrats, but in reality, these people, if they have vices, are using the power to help themselves. So we need to have traditional human values, not just technology. Uh, and the person, this is the Jakarta Post, right? This is a, an Indonesian who's prominent in the educational system. He want, advocates studying comparative religion. And that's very consistent with the cultural foundation. Um, they think because in Panchasila, number one principle is belief in God. So they do think their education should include um, God as um, a source of or related to character education as well as science education. So they're both integrated in Panchasila and the Indonesian constitution. Um, what kind of education is it? Physical, spiritual, biology, religion, and toleration, cognitive, your, your brain, and affective, your emotions. You have to combine these. Um, you have to appreciate the similarities and difference among ethnic cultures. And you have to find meaning and purpose in life through a connection to a community and the natural world. You have to have experiential learning, not abstract learning. Uh, make, make students sensitive to social problems and teach them humanitarian values. And the guy's just arguing, this is what Muhammad would want, obviously. Um, then they always have problems with extremism and they have problems with religious bigotry. And another article is about Muhammad, who is a protector of minority rights. I recommend the article. It's good. It's got a lot of stuff in it that you might not have thought was true of Muhammad. But you also understand that leaders, Indonesian Muslim leaders, promote this kind of view of Muhammad, right? This is the image of Muhammad that they think is most accurate, but also that they keep in the public eye because it's the only way they're gonna preserve their democracy. Um, all right, and there are elite people who make statements that provoke the persecution of minorities or some elite people just promote the hatred of all religion they want to throw it all out, and that'll create this huge animosity between the vast majority of the population that embraces some sort of religion. So religious toleration is the mean between extremes in Indonesia. It's the only way they're going to be able to have a coherent society, I think. That's what the founders thought. Okay, this one, the reasons people study, want to study. They're applying for a scholarship to the US and one wants public policy programs. And I quoted from our founders, our founders said, we are engaged in the science of government. I mean, they're enlightenment thinkers, um, but they, they also brought in like the Greeks sort of indirectly. Remember, they brought in Confucius. Thomas Jefferson's house looks like a Greek temple. I mean, stuff like that. Like they knew the Greeks were important for um, character development, but they wanted a science of government. They wanted it to be techno technologically or technical, technically well-built, well-constructed. Um, Let's see, so uh, one application talks about the old paradigm of government and the new paradigm. And this is all about ruling for the benefit of the ruled. 
And the new paradigm has nonprofits, it has private philanthropy, and it has, as well as government um, money that is pooled together. It's not government is bad or government is good or you know capitalism is bad or capitalism is good it's just trying to get the things to work together the pieces to work together someone wants to be an auditor um let's see someone wants to clean up the corruption so they want to get a law degree um someone wants uh yeah there's someone else who wants a law an anti-corruption law and um, someone wants an engineering degree. Um, I remember I loved volunteering for these things because, um, I mean, they're things I hadn't even crossed my mind, right? Um, so things like uh, one woman was applying for a degree in engineering and her goal was to was to develop a technique for making concrete that was a uh, low carbon footprint because everything in Indonesia, all the houses are concrete, probably because it's cheap, but it was, it's also cooler, right? You can have, you can build a house that's pretty cool if it's concrete, especially if you have, they have these, um, kind of like courtyards and then they would have a fountain water and some plants and it, it, it could stay pretty cool in the courtyard there um somebody else wanted to figure out how to grow wheat instead of rice um, there were all these things that of course if you're an american you don't think about it it's not what your country is particularly concerned with it's not facebook or TikTok or Amazon or Google, <laughs> it's just plain old concrete and wheat and things like that. And it was really fun. I love to blow my mind and, you know, just get into other worlds, the worlds of other people that are totally different from my own. That's what I really enjoy, because I think that's a, a way to free your mind. You get so locked up in your head, honestly. The, the worst prison is the one right there inside of your noggin. If you can get yourself out of that prison, you can probably do pretty well for yourself and other people. Um, all right, so the two lists of quotes. The quotes here, um, so Weinstein had what he called cosmic religious um, Let's see, I'm a deeply religious person, right? Enough for me, the mystery of life. So I, so that's Einstein's statement about the way he thinks of the universe. Um, and then I compared that to what we've been studying. Is this spiritual humanism? Is it Christianity or Judaism? Is it secular, right? Is there a label for the position? Um, do you think you want your worldview to have a label or do you just want to say this is what it is? I don't want labels. I don't want a box. Um, okay, then there's an interview with a theoretical physicist and Paul Davies, an astrophysicist. And he says, we have a natural longing to understand what God was thinking. Doesn't mean you're arrogant but rather that God created an intelligent, intelligible universe and we're the intellect that's capable of understanding it. And so we're supposed to try and understand it. And also that would lead us inevitably to thinking we're not supposed to destroy it. <laughs> um, especially since greed is the primary cause of the self-destruction. It's not like it's something we can't control that's the cause. It's something we very much could control. Um, anybody who doesn't approach science with religious awe is not a true scientist. It can only be created by those who aspire toward truth and understanding. And then here's another short quote a lot of the students like, science without religion is lame, or I would say dangerous, 
Religion without science is blind. Okay, so you can think about that. Um, let's see, organized complexity is another way of labeling the position of these people. Um, black holes, ancient cultures thought of time as organic. Um, Einstein, uh, then, then Newton made it into time and space into absolutes, but Einstein restored time to its rightful place at the heart of nature. Actually, this is more like Aristotle's view. Einstein is more consistent with Aristotle than it is with Newton. Um, all the cultures distinguish between chronological time and eternity. Um, let's see. So, oh, Einstein understood that there was a, a kindred spirit in the prophets and the psalmists of the Hebrew Bible, St. Francis and Buddha. These are the religious geniuses, have been distinguished by this kind of religious feeling, and is more important to keep that alive than it is just to keep the science alive. Um, all right. And Davies talks about the universe isn't only beautiful and harmonious, it's also fit for life. And so the way the universe exists is the way it has to be in order for eventually human beings to evolve. So, um, so he finds that miraculous or he finds that a good reason to think there was an original mind that sort of guided it in the beginning. And uh, the hand of God can work through quantum uncertainties. So they, this, they, all these views are consistent with um, religion and evolution and physics. Um, there is a point to it all. Well, I mean, yeah, the point is for us, I think, to love wisdom and to seek wisdom, right? In every aspect of our lives. Okay, and then Pokinghorn is about, um, he's a physicist and an Anglican priest. Um, and he talks about the Genesis story, the way it was intended to be read. It wasn't intended to be a scientific fact. It was intended to be poetry. Um, God created a world with independence, a world that's able to create itself, um, to reform itself, to move forward. Creation is an ongoing act. We need the insight of science and religion together. Um, the physical world is a lot more complex and beautiful and deeply structured than it seems at first. Uh, we need to listen to the words of poets and saints and science, right? They don't undermine each other. Um, let's see. God works through nature as much as through anything else. So we have no right to tromp tromp on it. Prayer is not magic. So you have to think about this too. Um, think about what, if you pray, what you think you're actually doing. Are you having a business deal with God? Or are you, um, is it just your way of gaining insight by focusing on the good, um, what you, where you want to go in life or what you think is best or where the intersection is between becoming the best person you can be, living the best life, and um, where you are now. So that's your idea of God or your idea of what God wants. Um, what you pray for tells a lot about you, <laughs> not necessarily a lot about God, but you do learn about yourself. Um, okay, poor, this person says, Prayers cooperate with God, right? Um, illness is affected by your belief system. 
um, there's the universe is a combination of necessity and novelty, right? Some things are emerging that are new within the context of forces that have always been the same. Gravity, the small nuclear force, the large nuclear force and electromagnetism, those things don't change. Um, okay. Then the question of free will, he talks about free will. And then he talks about tsunami, tectonic plates. So we'll talk about that um, in class, right? This is his approach, is that tectonic plates are necessary in order for the planet to have life. When they slip, they create an earthquake or a tsunami. Um, but that's not <laughs> because they don't do that because they want to kill a whole bunch of people. Um, when people know they're living in a place where there's going to be a huge earthquake, they just shouldn't be there. <laughs> and then, um, and then the issue of in Indonesia, they didn't know. And then there's, well, they could have known if we just applied the science. So that's, that's the kind of debate that you should think about because there are going to be a lot more climate disasters. Um, a tsunami was not caused by climate change. The ones that are caused by human caused climate change is a, is a different, I think. Uh, it's not as, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not necessary. We brought that on ourselves. Whereas the tsunami is necessary as a part of the natural world. And it was our ignorance about it that we brought on ourselves, not the tsunami itself. Whereas the strength of the hurricanes, the desert, the desertification, the droughts, the floods, those are things, the extreme cases are things we brought on ourselves. Um, what is the real me, right? Um, who am I? That's always the question. And then one more thing is um, politics and religion, the intersection of politics, economics, and religion, and globalization. So these are just um, overall issues. Um, it's pretty ironic that I think what everybody lives through all the time is that um, we have very more and more sophisticated science and technology, but we have very primitive drives, pleasure and fear. And we're capable of a very primitive level of brutality. We're also capable of a pseudo, a very primitive level of pseudo civilization, which is these brutal primitive instincts are tied to very sophisticated calculated rhetoric that taps your buttons deep inside without appearing to. And it makes people afraid. And people can really be functioning in survival mode when they're really not on the brink of survival. But when they do that, they want to find someone to blame. I mean, they're very vulnerable to authoritarianism if you let yourself become panicked, right? Become extremely afraid. Then you start wanting to look for a hero and a goat. Um, so be careful. And then this one is a, was made by a doctor from Syria. So he, he also talks about um, the world's religions and what religion is. So that is not a very long video, but it's kind of late at night too. So <laughs> uh, I just decided. Anyway, so I will see you tomorrow and we can go through all these things and um, that'll be it. So you can have your questions. I hope to have read all your papers that you've handed in so far, but 
I'm not quite sure how many there are, so I'm not quite sure I'm going to get through them all. Anyway, we'll see you tomorrow.